it's lovely to be back here again with you, dear listeners. First of all, I want to say a massive thank you for helping to make this podcast so successful and for helping to make the British Podcast Award possible. It's meant a great deal to me personally, so thank you. And this podcast will have true legacy because generations will know what it was like to experience a pandemic. People who are hitherto referred to as mere statistics, they've had their personalities, their contributions and their worth restored, thanks to you. This time of year, I know, is very painful for people. No doubt you'll be casting your mind back to three years ago, when the world was reeling from an invisible, deadly virus. We were still two weeks away from being in lockdown in the UK. I don't doubt that you're thinking now about the last time you spoke to your loved one, the last time you saw them, the last photo, the last hug, the last visit, never knowing that that would be the last time. Loss to COVID-19 is a grief like no other. In this series, we try to unpack that because so many of you do feel that that loss seems unreal or dreamlike, almost like you never lost your loved one, that they could reappear at any moment. And the bereaved are feeling this way because the usual rituals that go with the death, like saying goodbye, seeing and dressing the body of a loved one, having a funeral or memorial, those things were denied. Since we last got together, I've come to know the pain of loss and how that never leaves you. I'm heartbroken to say that I lost my lovely father, Thomas Rice, in April last year. I knew it was coming, but you're never ready, are you? And so this opening episode of the new season is dedicated to his memory. And I'm joined by my cousin, Samantha Hampshire, Nee Brady, who helps to remember my dad and also in doing so, remembering her mother, who she lost three years ago. Peggy, who was a sister to my father, and also her dad, Eddie, who she lost 22 years ago. Welcome, Sam, or Sammy Steele, as you're known in the family circles. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Oh, no, it's a pleasure. I feel really excited talking about your dad. I know it's sad because he's not here, but also I feel like I just want to say so much about him because they don't make them like your dad anymore. So people need to hear about this amazing man. <laughs> the first things that come to my mind are, well, you couldn't you couldn't miss Tom. He had a presence. He was six foot two. He was broad, big, strong hands, just would pick up anything. I heard my dad say that Tom once just picked the front of the car up, just lift it up to try and look underneath. I mean, how could you have that strength? And then just put it back down. And my dad used to be sort of in awe of of that strength and that just fearless, I think, as well. The other thing about Tom, he just didn't seem to fear things. But he was, you know, such a gentleman. So he's tall and strong and survived many pretty awful accidents that most people would end up in hospital. Um, He would fall off scaffolding, get back up and continue working. Most people would be, well, you know, they wouldn't be back at work for weeks. So strong in the physical sense, but also really strong and resilient in a sort of emotional way too. And he was just so gentle. So he had that height and strength, but he was just so gentle. And I don't think I ever saw him angry or was just really mild, sweet natured and so cheeky. A real youthfulness, you know, just there was a roguery just under the surface, yeah. always. Yeah, and he would sit. At, you know, when we used to come around for dinner, we'd sit at the table, and there were some really serious discussions going on about Ireland, about politics. You know, and my dad loved those conversations with Tom, and you know, it wouldn't be long though before your dad would just come in with some sort of cheeky comment, and then his eyes would light up, and he'd have this massive cheeky smile. And he'd be rubbing those big hands together, looking around the table and just everyone just cracked up laughing because you just it was contagious. You could not laugh when Tom was laughing. For me, I was, you know, I was at your house a lot, (laughs) wasn't I, at weekends. And your mum and dad just always sort of embraced me being there and such generous spirit, both your mum and dad, you know, incredibly generous, always hospitable, always open to me being there always welcoming and so interested in all the family they were just 
they're a strength to us Bradys. You know, you know, there's been some, and I won't go into detail here now, but there's been some really, really challenging, tough things going on in, in the family and stuff like that. And your mum and dad are just always there, always that strength, that steadiness, that kindness, you know, and that generosity. And I just think you, they just don't make them like that anymore. Even sort of the wider family, family like my nieces and nephews and stuff, all sort of really held your dad in real high esteem, you know, hugely respected, a legend. Oh. And uh, he's indestructible. So I still just sometimes just can't believe he's not here anymore. When I've been to see your mum, there's just always an expectation in me that this big, tall, final man with that cheeky smile will be there. And uh, even now, you know... It's just, uh, yeah, a shock not to see him. He was a big presence. We've said, you know, that he was indestructible. You know, there were so many stories down the years and he was a cat with nine lives. You know, he always survived. You know, he was buried under, I don't know how many tonne of concrete when some scaffolding gave way uh, on a job that he was on once. You know, I think he and his colleagues were given up for, for dead, really, until one of the bystanders heard some scratching on the underside of a brick and lo and behold it was dad and so they managed to you know get him out from this rubble he survived I think there was 80 stitches in his face but you know he lived to tell the story and also another anecdote was you know that he he got hit by a train on uh, some other uh, job somewhere and he would just refer to that as a glancing blow so he was he was just so (laughs) interruptible so what was so painful for me, and it was just so hard to witness, was in the weeks before he passed, was that he sort of lost the use of his legs. He lost the power in his legs, you know, so he just couldn't get up. He couldn't walk anymore. And that was just, you know, really, really, really hard for me to see because, you know, I always thought he was invincible, really. Mm. And I do remember being in the hospital and the nurses, I mean, with the best intentions were tries to keep him mobile I suppose but we've asked him four times to to get up and you know he just wasn't able you know it wasn't in him anymore but you know he was still smiling you know that yeah yeah that cheeky smile smile. it's hard to believe and it just feels like yesterday really that he passed but you know I'm I'm fortunate because I actually researched both mum and dad. I mean, having Irish parents, but being brought up in London, I think there's always a massive pull to the country of your parents and to your background, your ethnicity. And they weren't parents who ever went on about being Irish or that that was better than being English or anything like that. There was never any of that. They were just who they were. But obviously, you know, I always felt this pull towards Ireland and spent many years living there. But while there, you know, I had the chance to look into their backgrounds. And I'm really grateful for that because, you know, I came to understand them better by going back to the beginning, their route, you know, where they were brought up, how they were brought up, their day to day sort of lifestyle. And that is now just invaluable to me, really. Mm. And you know, the, the stuff that I discovered that I just never knew about them. Mum is from Cavan in Northwest Ireland. And I discovered that when she was growing up, she wasn't called Annie at all. She was actually called Sissy. Oh. <laughs> so I was like, sorry, <laughs> what's mm-hmm. that? Irish thing to do is to put nicknames on people. Mm. And it's, it's something that I do as well. And often, you know, with humour. So I remember discovering with mum when we went to visit a cousin to her mother, I think it was, and we called to the door. So she hadn't seen this lady in many, many years. Myself, my mum and my dad. And my mum knocked on the door. The lady came to the door and my mum said her married name. She said, I'm Annie Rice. And absolutely no recognition whatsoever. And then she said uh, her maiden name. She said, I'm Annie Maguire. And again, absolutely no recognition whatsoever. And then she said, I'm Annie Pat John. <laughs> the woman just went, Annie Pat John. Like this threw her hands in the air. And she was like, oh, my God, you know, come to the house. Let me make a cup of tea. I mean, I was just stood there just saying, you know, what is this? But, you know, so it's this sort of tradition in Ireland where you're named after, you know, patriarchal, but named after your father and then, you know, the grandfather before him. So, yeah, Annie Pat John. So I would be, you know, Karen Thomas Patrick. (laughs) 
discovering also that you know my dad wasn't called Tom but instead he was called Mossy Mm. you know uncovering these um, unexpected things and then you know my dad he had an unconventional upbringing in the sense that he wasn't brought up with his parents times were bad I mean dad was born in 1932 things were tough there was a lot of poverty in Ireland uh, large families children were often as they called it farmed out to live with other relations dad had gone as a child to live with his maternal grandparents mm. uh, but for whatever reason um, <laughs> They failed to tell him uh, that in actual fact, you know, he wasn't their son, but rather their grandson. He was referred to and known as uh, Mossy Roach, as opposed to Tom Rice, until Mm. one day when he was nine years old, walking home from school, a man in a cart, a flat cap, smoking a pipe, pulled up beside him and he said, what's your name? And my dad said, Mossy Roach. And he said, no, that's not your name. Your name's Tom Rice. (laughs) My dad obviously didn't know what to make of that at all and he said do you know who I am and dad said no and he said well you know I'm your I'm your dad and obviously you know dad didn't accept that at all he went home to his grandparents and said to his grandmother you know detailed what had happened and said she said oh what did this man look like so dad explained she said oh that's right yeah that he is he is your dad But my dad then said, but he's not old like Da, you know, meaning his granddad. Mm. I remember saying to my dad, if that affected him, such a stable person. There was no rancor, no bitterness, no anything like that. And he said, well, you know, it was it was wrong. But, you know, those those are the times that that were in it. I mean, he wouldn't have done it, but there's no bitterness. Bad feeling with your dad. No, never. No resentment. Your mother, Peggy, was farmed out as well as a child. She was the first and... As I understand it, she was at 18 months. Around that sort of age, she then went to live with her grandparents on the Rice side. So that's Hannah Wallace, me Wallace, wasn't it? Rice and I think he was Thomas, like your dad, wasn't he? I think, yeah, from that age, she was living with with them and they they brought her up. And she just said that she, uh, she never said how she when she was told or how she found out she never sort of spoke about those kind of things but certainly as she got older I don't know 11 12 she would knew about her real parents and would go around and visit but she was worried that she would sit by the door ready to go because she was worried she'd be asked to stay and she said that to her mind all she can remember is is her grandparents being her parents. So, you know, if you're not brought up by your own parents, you don't have that bond, do you? So then there was always that fear that 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 might switch back. And she said she just didn't like the thought of that because to her mind, she'd been brought up from such a young age with her grandparents that they were her parents. They were who she was bonded to. Um, She enjoyed going around to visit, but there was definitely a fear of being asked to stay, which she didn't want. Dad would say the same thing following the revelation when he met his real father on the roadside then he began to visit the home place and obviously got to know his parents and siblings but he would tell the story that he would always sit close to the door so that he could make a quick escape in case his parents ever decided to keep him Mm. when you when you think about that it's it's bizarre isn't it found out the reasons why you know my mum was the first child and why you know it's not like there were already loads of kids there it was she was the first one and it was difficult to understand why you know her parents sort of well why her grandparents brought her up it's sort of Never Maybe they needed them. help. They must have needed some help, mustn't they? they yeah. Must, you know, there must have been some difficulty there that was never taught. In those days, things like that weren't discussed, were they? And, and I don't think my mum ever knew either. Or if she did, she never said. And I asked my dad, I said to my dad, you know, was that normal of of that time, you know, to sort of for grandparents to raise kids if it was a big family? And he said he never remembered that. He never remembered that in Cavern, but... He said it's not to say it doesn't happen across Ireland, but he hadn't come across it. So I think he always felt a bit sad for my mum that that had happened and didn't understand the reasons why. But she seemed to be so happy. She seemed to be very happy with with that setup. So I think your dad was as well. He was very bonded to his grandparents. Hmm. My mum would often joke that, you know, he was spoiled, really, because that happened. <laughs> <laughs> because too. instead of being at home with, you know, you know, eight or ten children, other children, 
you know, they were the only ones. Although I'd have to say that dad, you could never say he was spoiled because he's working like a man really from the age of, you know, 12, mm. if not earlier. But yeah, he was bonded, yeah, to them. And, you know, grew up beside an orchard and a river, you know, lifelong love of apple pies and you know, he would cross. He would cross town to buy a, 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 a single packet of Kimberly apple pies. You know, <laughs> that was Dad's shop. You know, the apple pies. It wasn't all you shopping, for example. It must have got that sweet tooth from somewhere. But my mum does remember. You know, with with the grandparents, that I think every week she said Tom used to come over and Patsy and. You know, there'd be a house full of them coming over for Sunday lunch as she used to take them all for the day or the afternoon or something like that. Now, isn't it funny, you just, when your parents go, you know, there's so many questions I'd love to ask. Like, how did my mum find out that she, they weren't her parents? Because like, you had that conversation with your dad. Well, I never had that conversation with my mum. I don't even think I thought to ask. How did that come, you know, how did that come out? Yeah, I wish I'd asked more questions. Don't you? maybe you did maybe you did I asked a lot of questions <laughs> yeah. yeah but I do think it it's a good thing to do isn't it to to ask the questions and to make the memories mm. and you know I think important to record a voice as well because it brings such immediacy you yeah, know yeah, yeah. So evo- it's so evocative yeah we have it forever yeah upsetting but comforting at the same time talking about dad having a sweet tooth I remember once dad said that he was going up to the shop to buy some mints. Both myself and my mum were utterly shocked because, you know, dad wasn't a man who knew where the kitchen was, really. And so we both looked at each other thinking, my word, you know, what's going on here? So he said he's going up to buy some mint. And we began talking about, you know, what what meal we could make, you know, when he got back. So we were talking about, you know, spaghetti bolognese, I don't know, meatballs, potentially. Anyway, he disappeared for, you know... 20 minutes and then he came back and I think I said to him oh so did you go to the Irish butchers you know where did you get the mints and he said oh no he said you know I've got Murray mint (laughs) you know obviously yeah yeah sweets just you know that was just so uh, typical of dad there was no meal (laughs) had to be something with sugar in yes And also, I think, you know, what shaped him as well, I think, is that, you know, when he was a young man and there was no money really in Ireland, but he did manage to find work. So, you know, he worked like a man from a really young age, just trying to make some money. But he never really saw any of that money because the money just went to the upkeep Mm. of the house. You know what I mean? But I think that experience really shaped him. I think that it gave him this determined spirit you know, that he was going to make good, mm. you know, he didn't particularly want to emigrate. But when he did, I did ask him, you know, what was your ambition in coming to London? And he said it was just to make money. So I do believe, you know, from a young age that he just thought, I'm never going to be without money. Mm. I think that was that determined spirit came from childhood. Very humble with it. He did yeah. so well. He built and brought properties and things like that. But he was so humble with it so modest he would wasn't he he was just incredible laid everything down I recorded mum and dad have these voice recordings you know which I'll share a bit of one of them with you that is just precious it's the minute I hear dad's conversation humor the winding up all the time the giggle it's just you're right back there it's just like he's never gone it's a really precious thing to have the immediacy This is an excerpt of me asking my dad about the first time he saw my mum, Annie. They are joined in this conversation by dad's brother, Mike. Just look at this. She's got to be my wife. (laughs) That's what I said to myself, yeah. And that's what it was. What did you like about her, dad? I don't know what it was. It's appearance, you know, a person's appearance, you can go a lot on. A really sturdy, steady woman. Like, you know. Steady woman? Steady. Steady or sturdy? <laughs> <laughs> she was a steady, sturdy woman. <laughs> so do you remember when you saw her in the dance hall there, in the bamba? Remember that? I saw her in the bush stuff going to work first, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice hearing his voice oh yeah oh that must bring you comfort 
yeah transports you back funny photo any voice recording anything like that or a song mm. it's lovely to hear his voice actually it is so for you it's kind of phrases mind you i say phrases as well you know like cop on which mm. You know, when I was in school in London, you know, I would say cop on and, you know, my classmates would say, what on earth does that mean? Because, you know, I didn't even realise it was an Irish phrase, you know? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you drive me to distraction. I remember that one. <laughs> Horrible being without him. For example, you discover a photo you didn't realise that you took or that you'd forgotten about. And then there's a sudden sort of rush of excitement. It's like mm. so hard to explain. Yeah. This yeah. grief, grief thing, my word, it's really tough. Really tough. The first year, completely, you know, every first anniversary without, especially, you know, well, anyone that's close to you, but your parents, they've always been there. And it's just, you've never not known your dad not to be there, have you? And it's just a different way of living without him. And I think when I think about my dad and my mum, first year is very painful with the each anniversary that comes up and the second year you know it just eases a bit but I suppose now I, I mean I think of my dad and my mum you know a lot of times during the day and they're really firmly in my heart and I I can hear myself saying things that my dad you know to Daniel and Joseph give over give over like little phrases that he said frequently you know he's very much alive in my my heart and my head and and I think that of your dad I think you know thank god I had him in my life Thank God he was an uncle that really featured in my life because I've got so many memories of him. He's in my thoughts and in my heart. You know, he had a big impact on me growing up and, and who I am too and your mum, you know. And we don't always realise that, do we, when we're younger? He was 73 when he died and it just felt he went too young. I mean, it's a good age, but, you know, I hadn't sort of had the kids or anything by then and I would have loved for him to have met them, you know, that kind of stuff. And and sort of my older siblings, obviously, they had kids, you know, way back. And so dad got to know them and, and stuff like that. So it's I, in a way I thought, well, look. A lot of people lose their parents at a very young age. You know, I had dad until I was like 30. But yeah, I miss so much of him not being there. But I really, um, you know, I've got a photo in my purse and I look at that and, you know, I look at photos and yeah, he's very much alive in me, I would say. And and I talk to Daniel Joseph a lot. They feel like they know him. Oh, um, that's lovely. Because he yeah. was a brilliant character. And, and him and your dad got on so well because they both had that rogue cheekiness about them, didn't they? Yeah. And your dad had a really spiritual side. He yeah. was intuitive about people. Yeah. yeah. He was sensitive and quite an emotional man. He wouldn't think anything of just crying if he was worried about something. If he was worried about where I was, I got home late, he would just cry. And, you know, me, Andrew and Bridget would often cuddle him, you know, he just he was not afraid for a man of that era, show emotion and know that my dad always said they had a lot of admiration for Tom and he felt lucky to have Tom as a brother in law for the good conversations, for the humour and just, you know, just knowing that he was there and and that continuity, that stability. He always wanted to know what you were up to you know, when you were in Scotland, when you were in Not Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. He got it. Yes, he got your adventurous spirit. He did. He understood it. He was really into my choice of career, you know, journalism. I mean, you know, I'm a journalist because of my dad. Yeah. Political man, had a strong sense of justice. So I would often be listening to him talking about politics growing up, particularly the troubles in Northern Ireland. You know, he would mm. say no peace without justice unconsciously I think you know that he was the influence there you know to give people a voice to put a wrong right but he really got the chase you know of a story actually getting the story and publishing a story he really got it of course if there was a bit of danger or a risk you know well that's nothing because <laughs> you know he was a bit like that himself and he would say well you know you're not going to let anything get in the way of good story are you Karen you know he really really got it which is brilliant I love that about him and he used to collect your stories as well I know when I used to go and see your mum and dad if you were when you were in Scotland and stuff like that and uh, you know he'd be keeping you know the, the stories that you wrote and oh I didn't, yeah. oh, I didn't know that yeah oh. why did I not tell you that I didn't know that oh no. he used to get the paper out and he'd say guess who wrote this 
I said, it's got to be Karen. So we'd read through it and you could see he was really proud. Oh. Really proud. I can't believe I didn't tell you that. That's so sweet. I play it careful because, you know, I could say stuff to your dad. Oh, yeah, you know, Karen's going here and there. But then your mum, she would worry because your dad would say, oh, you know, Karen's here or there or in Northern Ireland, let's say, or something like that. You know, your dad would sort of be really interested and want to hear about it. But of course, I had to be careful if your mum came in the room, because if she heard that, she would worry. So it was yeah. always <laughs> trying to be careful. Like oh. say. It's so painful, the loss of dad, because it's an end of unconditional love, mm -hmm. which is hugely upsetting. I mean, I feel that we were kindred spirits in a lot of ways <laughs> because, you know, I've got his determination and you know, his adventurous side. But he was always just, he had 100% confidence in me. He did, and yeah. my abilities. And that sort of, you know, it was always there, that vote of confidence. I say an end of unconditional love because obviously I can't tap into that again. But then I'll never forget, you know, the things that he did say. Yeah. So it's an end and a different departure, I suppose. Yeah, but it's not left you. It's still there. No, that's there but it's just really hard yeah, yeah yeah and you know you can be steady for for ages and then all of a sudden just out of nowhere you know something will just come up mm. and you'll be in pieces yeah it's overwhelming isn't it it really is i am fortunate because dad was 89 when he passed he knew my daughter and all his grandkids so in that way that's brilliant but it doesn't matter what age you lose your parents it's just it's tremendously hard. For me, the end of unconditional love in a way, and also, I mean, you know, family is the bedrock of life. Mm. And with dad's passing, you know, I feel that those sort of tectonic plates, you know, our foundation, you know, that they've shifted substantially. Mm. That's quite a scary, uncomfortable feeling. I think people call it anticipatory grief, that when you're living with the fear that you're going to lose you know someone that you love and obviously that person would be my mother mm. who you know an amazingly independent fantastic matriarch but at 92 you know having lost you know the man of her life really you know mm. for 70 years is, is tough so yeah it's a hard a hard reality and then they pass the baton on to us so we become the aunts and uncles and mothers to do you know no it, pressure. I know, but it's because it's always like it was always them, wasn't it? And when my parents were alive, it's always. And then you know, once you come to terms with the loss, which you know takes its time, of course, a long time, then you realise actually, oh, okay, I'm the grown up now. I've got nieces and nephews expecting that from me. I've got two sons expecting that from me. What? <laughs> Am I grim to do that? Can I do what your mum, your dad, my mum and dad were and, and did? He was also a great storyteller, or in Irish they would call that a shonaki, great history of storytelling in Ireland, where people are the custodians, if you like, of, mm. of social history, and they pass these stories on from generation to generation. And dad was definitely part of that tradition. I love a story too, so I think I take that from him also. And I do remember him relating how he would listen to his own father by candlelight tell stories of how when he was growing up, that was in the War of Independence in Ireland at a time when the British had sent over who they called Black and Tans to suppress the um, what turned out to be terrorise the local population. They were called black and tans, but they were effectively criminals let, let out of prison. And so our grandfather, Patrick, he would tell stories of how he set traps for the black and tans under moonlight <laughs> in North Kerry. And so dad would be listening to these stories by candlelight. And, you know, I remember him telling stories of banshees, you know, the, the foreteller of death in a family and the banshee would come in different forms. I remember my dad saying that once at a window in the farmhouse, there was a ball of fire. And then, you know, lo and behold, the next day somebody passed. Also yeah. a, a black carriage led by four or six black horses. I've heard that one. Was, did your, yeah. dad see? your dad saw that, did he? Yeah. 
uh, racing through the the countryside, and again, you know, a foreteller of of somebody's impending demise. And the screaming as well. There was often a the wailing. Was it um, a woman in white? These mm. kind of, these kind of sort of folkloric stories. He developed dementia towards the mm. end, but sort of core personality traits were still there. You know, the the humour, the generosity, yes. the gentleness. A small thing that we were both stood in the uh, the doorway of the living room. I just remember our feet were sort of lined up together. For some reason, we just stood side by side. And then he just started tapping my, my toe. <laughs> you know, just an affectionate little, you know. Yeah. I loved it. You know, just, you know. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's really sweet, isn't it? It's sweet. Just a little bit of humour there. Sort of a video call with him before he passed. He was still conscious. And I remember sort of saying, you know, I'm on my way and coming. And then, you know, he sort of raised the eyebrows, you know. That was his smile to acknowledge, yeah, you know, wow, great. I always want to see you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you could see that affection in him and that love, couldn't you? Oh, yeah. Dad, you know, thankfully didn't didn't pass from COVID. This series is about that loss being so very complicated because people who lost to COVID were denied death rituals. They were denied mm-hmm. goodbye, seeing or dressing the body of a loved one, you know, a funeral, a memorial. And we're trying to unpack that grief which and that loss because the loss for many people feels very surreal and that it didn't happen because they didn't experience any of those things. Obviously, I'm grateful to have had that time with Dad. At the very end, I couldn't be there. When, you know, I did get to the hospital, you know, other family members had departed at that point. And I asked the nurse, you know, to see if I could see my dad. Mm. And he was actually presented to me in a body bag, plastic mm. body bag. And I was just so, so shocked oh that anyone goodness. could possibly present, you know, a loved one to you in that way. Yeah, it's just very traumatising. It's something Shocking. that I can't get out of my head. No. And just so sort of dehumanising. So I can, you know, really relate to people mm. who have lost to COVID and, you know, feel that because all these rituals were denied, coffin couldn't be held high, that somebody would be put in a coffin, you know, thing on this sort of dehumanising, delegitimising events that are just incredibly, incredibly hard and mm. just make the grieving even worse. Yeah, it makes it much more complex than grieving, I think. Those rituals are so vitally important, aren't they? You know, I think of both my parents, thank goodness we could have, you know, go through those rituals. And, you know, whilst it's tough going through those rituals, it's there's something very comforting, isn't there? In, you know, if you, whatever you, you know, the funeral, whether it's a mass or it was a, a mass in, in both my parents cases as you know and when you look around behind you and you see all those people in the church it is the most wonderful feeling of love do you know you just just feel uplifted by it all in your worst moments and then you feel they're laid to rest with respect and dignity but not only that afterwards that celebration of life for both my dad and my mum weren't you know from my memory you know they were lovely experiences they were lovely experiences filled with love and everybody you know and I remember at your dad's as well it was all talk about them and, and all the funny stories and there's so much comfort and triggering of memories and stuff like that it's just so comforting and I, I just I just can't imagine having that taken away I, I, yeah for for me how that feels but also for my mum and dad if they didn't have that I just think that's just so wrong that they didn't have that goodbye that because, you know, we just don't know, do we? We're spiritual and we think that somehow they must feel that to be celebrated in that way and feel all that love and see how many people care about them and love them be is such a wonderful thing. And to have not have that, I just I just can't imagine it. I think they very much feel that the loss of these very important people doesn't matter. Mm. That was definitely why I created the podcast. You know, to give these people a voice. And in actual fact, one of the ladies on the first series, Jane, there was an unaccompanied funeral for her husband because she couldn't really be away from her son. You know, so it was a choice that she just had to make. She had to be with her son. Just his dad, you know, she said being able to speak on the podcast was actually like having a funeral for him. Mm. So can you imagine? And that's just one element 
of the things that she didn't get to do. And the guilt, I'd imagine there, even though it's not that person's fault, the guilt of not being able to go through those rituals for that person that you love that was close to you. It's, that's why I think it just must be so incredibly complex. Coping strategies, I talk about them a lot, mm. I cry a lot. I think that's really important. That's really important. I think well, some of the things I found really difficult because I think we don't, in, in the culture here and in many places, is, you know, when when somebody passes, there's an awkwardness. There can be awkwardness. Oh, I better not mention, I don't want to. And it's, it's, I'm sure it's well-intentioned. They don't want to bring that person up in conversation in case it causes upset and so on. And I think I used to find that really hard. If people, you know, I'd go and see people not long after my dad died, you know, even if it was a few months and the same for my mum as well. And, you know, it was just not mentioned. They weren't mentioned. I just don't mind that. Even though I knew it was for the best intentions, I still found it really hurtful. So I would just start talking, you know, and then perhaps when people see that you're comfortable talking then they're OK. But and, and getting together with your siblings, I think you're all grieving. Initially, it's hard because you're all grieving and need to give one another space. But as time starts to heal, you know, you've got one another, you know, and I see things in my brothers and sisters that remind me of my mum and dad. And I find that comforting, too. And even in my own sons, I see things that remind me of my dad. So to me, as time goes on, it's just keeping those conversations alive and seeing in relatives, you know, brothers and sisters, my kids, some of those things. Even in myself, I, like I said to you earlier, I say things or do things. Dad was sort of unusual for his time in that he was quite new age. He was into, you know, vitamins, yoga, meditation, all that sort of stuff. And I, I find that at the time, I used to think, like being a teenager, I'd say, Dad, you're really weird, you know, and he'd laugh <laughs> his head off. And I never thought in a million years that I would be interested in those things when I get out, got older. So, you know, I get a lot from yoga and meditation. And, you know, I do. I go down to the health shop and get bits and pieces. So, yeah, it's just those sort of things that you're keeping that person alive, aren't you? For me, I just don't like going to the grave. I, for a lot of people, that's a real comfort. Mm. For me, I, I just find that I don't like that. That's not something I do very often. And then I feel guilty about that. But for me, it's much more comforting to, to think of him and his spirit and him being alive and that we're keeping him alive. I like to go to the grave. I like to have a chat. Yeah. I just don't like to think of him there. I think of him in my home. His spirit is around me. And, and when I go to the grave, it gives me a different impression and it upsets me. So I, I don't. I don't like it but that's the thing it's such a personal thing that gives you comfort just everyone's so different and I think you know when you're grieving as well your brothers and sisters you know everyone reacts so differently don't they as well such a personal thing I said to your mum you know we were talking about your dad because I think it's really important isn't it to keep those conversations going about your dad I just said to her that you know he always made you laugh and didn't he you would always laugh you know sometimes you see couples that have been married for well how long were your mum and dad married six was it six, seven six, years but they went, out, they went out for three years so sort of 70 six. year romance so you know you see couples that have been a long time and actually you can see irritation <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the jokes aren't funny anymore and stuff like that. But I never saw that in your mum. And I said that, I made that comment. I said to her that he always made you laugh. You never seemed sort of, you know, irritated or oh, I've heard that one before or, you know, you laughed every time. Like it was the first time you heard it. I said, yeah, because he was just a funny man. And, 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 and you know, that laugh, you know, that giggling, that cheeky laughter, I think was just infectious, wasn't it? Enjoyed his humour, didn't she? And I've had this massive urge, well, firstly, to Kerry get, get into the All-Ireland anytime soon, then I'll be there to honour him, because obviously, you know, he was a, a Kerry man. And then, uh, but more particularly, there's a story from his childhood when he was a young boy. There was a river at the back of the house where he was reared. I mean, he was a bit wild, a bit adventurous. He would jump into a, a barrel that was on the yes, river. I and remember hearing float, that. Well, I say float. <laughs> <laughs> at great speed from one part of Kerry down to Lestole, for example, you know, managed to survive that as well, unscathed. They couldn't swim, could they? 
No, of course, none of them could. It didn't no. matter if they were reared by the sea. It didn't matter. They just couldn't swim or weren't taught. Now, I've got this massive urge now. I want to go to the Gale River and I want to walk, you know, where he where he went in the barrel. You know, I want to do that journey. So I'm kind of determined, yeah. whatever that is, you know, I have to, I have to do it. I have to make it real. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Things. And I can imagine him just spontaneously, because he, he had a, such a free spirit, didn't he? And such adventure. He would just think, right, that's what I'm going to do. And just jump in there and do it without any fear. No, fearless. <laughs> Enjoying it, laughing and howling, probably. <laughs> in terms of legacy, what would you say about dad? It's a big one. I don't think I could replicate his legacy no matter how long I lived. The biggest legacy must be all of you, isn't it? You know, he's had five amazing kids. Do you know what I mean? And you've all done great things. You're all part of him. You know, you'll all have elements of him. You keep him and his spirit alive. And I think that he would see that as his greatest legacy too, because he had a lot of pride, didn't he? He's very proud and adored all of you. So, and knowing your dad, and he's a complete family man, wasn't he? You know, that's got to be the most amazing legacy and then grandchildren just think how big the family is he worked hard he put his work ethic was incredible wasn't it you know and you have that and your sister and your, your brothers and sisters he's you know there's so much of him in all of you and I I just think he worked so hard but he didn't other than that his time was with family wasn't it he would yeah. I remember he'd come home and have this massive dinner and eat I used to try and count how many potatoes he had. And we're not talking small potatoes. <laughs> we're talking like big potatoes. And he'd have like, I'm sure I counted about 10. I just couldn't believe it. We were so happy, like so happy eating. Food was an enormous pleasure for him, wasn't it? Yes. And... <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> and then that, you know, that I, I was straight out then for the cake after, wasn't it? Me too. There's always room for, for that little bit of cake or a few biscuits. And then he just seemed happy. He didn't. He didn't want. Didn't seem to want for much, really. Just. That's a great way to be, isn't it? Yeah. His glass was full. Yeah, his glass was full with hard work, providing for his family, making sure that it was, you know, that you're all financially secure, and that he looked after your mum, and that he could, you know, see you all growing up and have kids and. That just seemed to make him really happy, didn't it? And his wider family, he's always given that time to yeah. all of us, to me, my brothers and sisters, to my mum and dad. Um, he's uh... Yeah, he said that uh, my daughter was my uh, greatest asset. Yeah. And he described her, which is lovely. Yeah. So that's how he felt about all of you then, didn't he? In terms of his legacy, I think, you know, for someone who had such a tough start in life, you know, he really transmitted love and he was a devoted father and definitely a devoted husband. Mm. Always my cheerleader. And, you know, he taught me to make a difference. And really, I suppose, ultimately, that lesson, you know, has led me to this place here with you today in the creation of the podcast. So, you know, while obviously, you know, I made the podcast happen, it was, you know, his inspiration his lesson in terms of making a difference in the lives of others you know that was the driving force really so that's just a beautiful thing because obviously the podcast has made such a difference to the lives of so many in in such extraordinary desperate times really mm. but it's been you know a space for people to to grieve and to be heard it's thanks to dad really thanks to thomas rice for that it's great for our parents to see you know the bond that we built and the hours and times that we spent together and they always encouraged that my dad saw you as a fourth daughter didn't he that's right he really touched when he said that yeah that was at the end yeah so lovely and I loved him Eddie Brady yeah and I, that's what I love when we meet up we'll talk about your dad we'll talk about my dad we'll talk about my mum you know we keep them we keep them alive and yeah. we've got to keep doing that. So thanks for sharing all those lovely thoughts, Sam, on the trip down memory lane. Pleasure. It makes me happy. You, oh, you must have been seeing me smiling, talking about your dad. Nice. <laughs> he brings a smile to your face, doesn't he? Thanks for listening and for your support. Next week, I'll pull together three really fascinating grief trauma experts 
will help us understand the phenomenon that is distorted grief and how it can be managed. Lastly, I'd like to ask a favour. For those of you who know me, you'll know that Stolen Goodbyes really is a passion project. That means that I'm doing this for free because I believe it's really, really important that these stories are recorded for now, help the bereaved and also for the future so that future generations understand what it was like to live through a pandemic. I really want to continue doing this and in order to do so, I would ask for a small thank you in return that you make a donation if you can. The price of a coffee would be amazing. This will help with the cost of production and hosting the podcast as it really is my goal to continue doing this. You can make a donation via my website which is www.karen-rice.com or alternatively you should be able to find a donation link in the show notes of this episode. Thanks so much if you can help and for listening. Please do spread the word about the Stolen Goodbyes podcast. Please share, if you can, this episode and any future episodes that you enjoyed via social media. You can follow me on Twitter at RiceKMC. Stolen Goodbyes is also on Facebook and Instagram. So please do follow and keep in touch. All the best until next week. Good luck. Mm -hmm.